Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation titled The Fecal Elastase 1, a Biomarker for Pancreatic Exocrine Insufficiency. I am Xavier Gutierrez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by DSORN. To learn more, please visit www.dsorn.com. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Our speaker will answer your questions via email following this webinar. And if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window. Or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, I would like to present today's speaker, Dr. Roy Sherwood, Professor of Clinical Biochemistry at King's College London. He is the co-author of more than 200 peer reviewed papers, 35 reviews and book chapters and the book Liver Disease and Laboratory Medicine, published by the Association of Clinical Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Sherwood will now begin his presentation. Hello, my name is Professor Roy Sherwood. I'm Professor of Clinical Biochemistry at King's College London. And up until a couple of years ago, I was also the scientific director of pathology for pathology that covered Guy's Hospital, St. Thomas's Hospital, and King's College Hospital. And we had a center for pancreatic and pancreatic biliary surgery. Um, so what I want to talk about in this webinar is uh, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and exocrine disease uh, and the markers that the laboratory can use to be able to test and diagnose uh, that condition. So if we start with something very simple, uh, the pancreas itself, uh, it is a glandular uh, organ located almost centrally within the abdomen, and you can see can be divided into head, uh, body, and tail. And its function can be divided into two parts. The endocrine function, which is the regulation of glucose by the release, oh, sorry, the release into the bloodstream of glucagon and insulin. Whereas from the point of the exocrine function, which is what we're really interested in, uh, this is to release uh, the digestive juices into the small bowel via the pancreatic duct, which comes out almost opposite the bile duct. And these pancreatic juices uh, serve to continue the focus break down of food which started in the stomach into the parts that can be absorbed, such as proteins, uh, fats, and carbohydrates. So if we look in slightly more detail to that, I've said that the endocrine function can be assessed by measuring glucose itself, but also potentially by measuring uh, insulin and glucagon. The exocrine function can be divided into two parts. That part that reduces the fluid itself and associated with the fluid bicarbonate. And then the cells that produce the enzymes that take part in digestion. And as a list on this slide of the enzymes that are relevant uh, to digestive processes. Uh, amylase, lipase, trypsin, I will mention uh, further detail. Uh, there is chymotrypsin, there is a family of esterases and carboxyesterases. There is elastase, which we will come to later on in terms of its measurement in feces, and there are the uh, carboxypeptidases. If we now consider first pancreatic disease, we can divide that into those that present in the neonatal or early infant period, which really are cystic fibrosis, and something that's termed Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome, which is actually the aplasia 
of the pan pancreatic alpha cells. And we'll come back uh, to that in, in a little while. In children and uh, in adults, then you can have three categories uh, of pancreatic disease, uh, acute pancreatitis, and nowadays we know that um, some of the acute pancreatitis cases presenting in children uh, may be uh, uh, hereditary pancreatitis due to mutations in the two genes that protect from the activation of trypsin within the pancreas. So that's the uh, PRSS1 gene, the cationic trypsinogen gene, and the SPINK1 uh, serine protease inhibitor Casal type 1 genes. And essentially, these mutations lead to loss of function, and that loss of function means that trypsin is activated and destroys cells within the pancreas. There's chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic insufficiency, uh, which again we'll expand on further, and uh, pancreatic cancer, which still has one of the worst prognoses of any of the cancers due to uh, late uh, detection um, because of lack of pain associated with it. And there are some markers for pancreatic cancer, but that's beyond the scope of uh, this particular webinar. So if we consider that we're interested in, and uh, a few definitions along the way, uh, <clears throat> chronic pancreatitis is a chronic inflammatory disease of the pancreas uh, that can uh, cause pain, um, but also can cause loss of pancreatic function, and that loss may be permanent if the pancreatitis uh, goes on too long. And what we want to talk about is uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI. Um, and in EPI, the activation uh, activity levels of pancreatic enzymes are reduced and this leads to failure to break down the foods uh, leading to maldigestion uh, and uh, to the malabsorption because the food is not in a state that can be absorbed. Um, this in itself then leads on to malnutrition. And the typical clinical symptoms include steatorrhea because with the absence of lipase being present uh, in the gut, you are unable to break down the fats and therefore you get fatty stool, which is what steatorrhea means. I said you can get malnutrition and a first sign of malnutrition may well be weight loss. You can get abdominal discomfort because you have uh, undigested uh, food and malnutrition we've already dealt with. Any condition that can block the pancreatic duct can also cause a chronic pancreatitis, and this sometimes can be the manifestation of pancreatic cancer if the actual tumour uh, is in the position that causes obstruction of the outflow of the pancreatic duct. And anything that causes damage or destroys the cells within the pancreas uh, producing the enzymes can cause a pancreatic insufficiency. If we consider the epidemiology and uh, the prevalence, um, it is not necessarily a common uh, disease. Um, most of the data for chronic pancreatitis comes from large case series and various cross-sectional uh, studies. Um, Population-based data is, is scarce because its incidence is ranging from 5 to 12 per 100,000 uh, and the prevalence of 35 to 45 per 100,000. And it does appear to occur more frequently in men than uh, in women. And when we look in the next slide and the causes, it may be possible to see why that's the case. Establishing an early diagnosis can be very difficult because it mimics in many ways other conditions. And in some patients who develop acute pancreatitis, they go on to progress to chronic pancreatitis. 
And there's some useful uh, information, for example, um, from the various associations. This uh, particular data comes from the American Pancreatic Association uh, practice guidelines um, that were published in uh, Pancreas, uh, the journal Pancreas, in uh, 2014. If we consider the actual etiologies and an idea of the type of, uh, of uh, uh, incidents that occur, um, in uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, eventually there is almost certainly a uh, type of development to it. Uh, the presence in type 1 diabetes is around 25 to 50 seven percent and in type two about 20 to 35 uh, percent in patients with untreated celiac disease and in irritable bowel uh, disease, uh, syndrome then sorry inflammatory bowel disease uh, then the prevalences can be very variable celiac from four to eighty uh, percent ibd from 14 to 74 percent and in GI surgery, uh, depending upon the surgery involved, uh, it can be up to 100%. So, for example, uh, the neuroendocrine tumours that can occur tend to occur within the pancreas and can result uh, in surgery uh, with uh, variable extents of pancreatic removal. But the biggest causes of uh, API are the uh, presence of uh, alcohol, uh, alcoholism and uh, obstruction from the fact that the pancreatic duct comes out opposite the uh, gallbladder uh, bile ducts and uh, large amounts of gallstones um, can cause it. So there is a variety of cases uh, that may um, mean that a diagnosis of EPI needs to be considered. So if we are looking to diagnose EPI, um, there is imaging, uh, there are uh, invasive methods, um, endoscopic methods that have a risk of acute pancreatitis, uh, but there are also the various laboratory-based tests uh, that one can use. Uh, if we consider the gold standard, and I'll give a bit more detail of that in the next slides, uh, the direct tests, as they're called, because you have to pass a tube down, include the secretin pancreasinin test, which is the gold standard. The Lund test meal, which is long since discontinued, and I don't believe you can even get the test meal uh, constituted anymore. The indirect tests, which I will show a slide on, although uh, mostly they are no longer available. The enzymes and isoenzyme estimation in plasma and serum, and then the various fecal tests, including fecal fat, chymotrypsin, and the one we're most interested in in this particular webinar, and that is elastase 1. <clears throat> so if we look at our gold standard, you have to cite a tube, usually using fluoroscopic control, in the duodenum past the pancreatic duct so that you are able to aspirate the fluid release from the pancreas. Now, this is not necessarily easy. I've done many in my time, and you're often doing them in very small infants and children uh, who often need some sedation, but you can't sedate them significantly because otherwise they won't actually produce any uh, fluid. And you give secretin, which does exactly what it uh, says it does, it induces fluid secretion. And then you give a uh, pancreasinin, or sometimes known in the US, a uh, kerolin, to induce the enzyme production. Um, I always used to give them in that order, secretin first to get the fluid flowing, and then pancreasinin, uh, but others give them together. Then you collect fluid, usually for uh, 15 to 30 minutes, and analyze for the constituent parts that make up this exocrine secretion. So the fluid volume, the bicarbonate, or measure pH, which allows you to assess the 
uh, response to secretin, and then some form of enzyme measurements. I intended to measure M amylase and trypsin. You can measure amylase and uh, lipase. Where in children it's particularly useful is because of the different pathologies associated with cystic fibrosis and schwachmann diamond syndrome or pancreatic aplasia. In cystic fibrosis, you get obstruction. Therefore, you have a low fluid output, but you have a normal enzyme concentration. It, whereas in pancreatic aplasia, by definition, the cells producing fluid are normal, so the fluid volume and pH are normal, but there is very, very low uh, enzyme uh, concentration. If we now consider why measurement of the enzymes produced in the pancreas in blood, which would be very easy to do, uh, have disadvantages, then we'll start with amylase. Amylase has uh, two predominant uh, isoenzymes, a pancreatic and a non-pancreatic, which is predominantly a salivary, about 95%. And if you separate these in a plasma sample, they're roughly in a 50-50 concentration. A typical upper limit of normal is considered to be 100 units per litre. And most definitions of pan acute pancreatitis take three to four times the upper limit of normal as being the cutoff values above that being associated with acute pancreatitis. But chronic pancreatitis may not elevate plasma amylase to any significant effect. And there are two major problems with the use of amylase, and that is that ethnicity has an effect on amylase. Subjects of African origin have a higher reference range for non-pancreatic amylase than do subjects of any other ethnic origin. And we found this particularly when in the early days of anti-HIV therapy, and we set up uh, an isoamylase system for the Medical Research Council, the early drugs caused occasional cases of acute pancreatitis. And what we were finding was patients with no symptoms of African origin who had significant, significantly raised uh, amylase values. And these turned out to be of non-pancreatic uh, origin predominantly salivary. And then in some patients, you've got macroamylasemia, which are IgG uh, complexes, which are large, and because they are large, uh, they are not excreted as rapidly as uh, amylase and tend to cause an increase in the results. So there are disadvantages to amylase. Lipase has greater specificity, although it's not specific. It is about 80 to 90 percent uh, derived from the pancreas, but there are uh, sublingual forms, and uh, in lactating women, there is a breast milk uh, isoenzyme. It is becoming much easier to me measure now, and it's becoming less expensive, although it is still significantly greater cost and less availability than measurement of amylase. It does not, however, have any uh, effect associated with ethnicity. Now, trypsin would be ideally the candidate. It's uh, a proteolytic enzyme. Um, it's secreted as an inactive zymogen, uh, trypsinogen, and is activated by itself, as it were, by trypsin once secreted into the GI tract. Now, because it is a proteolytic enzyme, it has relatively low specificity for the proteins that it actually tackles. And so acute attacks of pancreatitis can result in the release of trypsin and autodigestion of the pancreas. Now, clearly, you do not want that in a normal state. So any active trypsin that's released into the circulation is inactivated by binding to the protease inhibitors. Now, alpha-1 antitrypsin or alpha-1 antiprotease inhibitor, as it really should be called, and alpha-2 macroglobulin. 
the latter actually being the biggest uh, and proportion of inhibition uh, that actually occurs. The complexes formed with trypsin and alpha-2 macroglobulin are such that this whole molecule is surrounded and therefore the trypsin bound to uh, A2M is not measurable. But those bound to alpha-1 and to trypsin uh, can be, as can any uh, trypsinogen which is released into the circulation. Most trypsinogen is not, and it's very rare to see it uh, in adults. Uh, in the neonates, because of leaky vessels, it can be seen um, in small amounts. In the event of uh, cystic fibrosis, the mucal plugs that block the pancreatic duct mean more trypsinogen gets out into the circulation. And this is used in the blood spot screening for uh, diseases that takes place in the first seven days of life uh, in the UK, when it was started around 2006. Nowadays, of course, genotyping allows uh, confirmation, but there are so many uh, mutations that last count well over 600 uh, that almost invariably uh, whole gene sequencing is required to establish and confirm a diagnosis. The pancreolaural test uh, was an interesting uh, tubeless test. It's an indirect test. Uh, you give uh, fluorescein, um, which is a, a, a colorless dye, that if you change the pH uh, to an alkaline pH, it uh, becomes an orange-green color uh, and fluoresces. So what you give is the esterized form, the fluorescein dilorate, and pancreatic esterase breaks this down to give lauric acid and the fluorescein, uh, which is then absorbed. The fluorescein is absorbed and excreted unchanged in the urine, uh, and then you do it over two days, one in which you only give fluorescein, the other in which you give fluorescein dilorate, and then you express results as a ratio between the two. The uh, results have a gray zone um, between uh, 20 and 30. Uh, and importantly, it is certainly no longer available in the pharmaceutically pure form that used to be sold both in the UK and the USA. So it really may be considered a historic test. A similar uh, one to that um, is the nt -Paba. Uh, test. And NT PABA was uh, N benzoyl tyrosine amino benzoic acid uh, and it's cleaved by chymotrypsin. And you measure uh, PABA in the urine in the same way, or you can measure uh, PABA in blood. But again, uh, certainly in the UK, pharmaceutical grade NT uh, PABA is no longer available. So somewhat discontinued. If we now consider the faecal tests, faecal fat, some people consider to be a silver standard in a three-day collection, although the reliability of patients collecting three days of faeces is often poor. Uh, typically, to improve the case, carmine red uh, dye markers were uh, ingested at the same beginning of the test, and when they appeared, uh, that was typically a three days. The analytical methodology itself was suspect, it used to involve burettes, um, and was unpleasant for both patients and staff. It is still carried out in certain research centres, and it is still often incorporated into uh, drug studies. Carmatrypsin uh, had a good, as it were, uh, potential. However, the analytical methodology is not robust, the number of enzyme immunoassays that are available give different numbers. There is no uh, recognized standard. And its sensitivity for chronic pancreatitis is only between 70 and 90 percent. And false positives have been described in a number of other GI tract diseases. So now we've come round to elastase, or to be correct, elastase 1. This is an endoprotease and a steroid binding protein. 
uh, the concentrations in faeces are, are fivefold higher than in the fluid, pancreatic fluid itself. So there is a concentrating effect uh, in the faeces. And it has good stability uh, within a week at uh, room temperature and longer at minus 20. And results are low in both obstructive conditions, uh, such as cystic fibrosis, and in uh, pancreatic insufficiency of a chronic form. And in most cases, the uh, sensitivities and specificities fall into the 80 to 90% bracket. But I'll, I'll give some greater detail of that uh, near the end. The standard cutoff is almost invariably the same for all methods and is around 200 microgram per gram of wet weight. It has better specificity than chymotrypsin. And most guidelines now recommend it as a replacement for the pancreatal test. It is, however, not valid in liquid stools because of a dilutional effect. You don't get this uh, five-fold concentrating effect if the stool is liquid. Now, there's a limited number of assays available. Um, there are a number uh, three elicers, and there is uh, a qualitative immunochromatography test, and then there is the only automated assay, uh, the chemiluminescent assay. The uh, Shibo Biotech assay, um, the ELISA has been around the longest, and it has two uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies uh, to the epitope sites uh, on elastase. The immunochromatography method is a, a qualitative test designed to be potentially a near patient test and uses the same antibodies as the ELISA test. Uh, the Bioserve uh, method, ELISA uses two polyclonal antibodies, the Alco, which is common in the US, two monoclonal antibodies, and the chemiluminescent uh, automated immunoassay uh, has two monoclonal antibodies. Now, importantly, the extraction of elastase from the sample uh, is variable from weighing methodologies to various suggested extraction uh, devices. And, and this is simply the diasorin uh, device, which is uh, like a wand that is then inserted uh, into a tube in such a way that that tube then becomes the vessel that is placed onto the liaison XL analyzer for testing itself. And th these five steps just show that it is a fairly simple uh, means of doing the extraction. Usually at this point in years, uh, previous years, uh, I put a number of slides up showing various uh, uh, reports that have been published of studies uh, comparing either elastase with the secretin test or with fecal fat. But luckily in 2018, there was a meta-analysis which had uh, 14 studies, um, significant number of cases, 428 cases of EPI with 670 controls uh, that compared elastase with the gold standard secretin stimulation test. And that had a sensitivity of 77% and a specificity of 88%. And in another six studies that compared elastase with the silver standard in fecal fat, that had a sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 88%. And in all cases, this 200 microgram per gram uh, cutoff was used. And importantly, the false negative rate was 1.1% and the false positive rate was around 11%. Now, <clears throat> Pancreatic involvement during the course of uh, inflammatory bowel disease has been noted. And depending on the country that the studies have been carried out on, the number of cases in which elastase and calprotectin are requested together in stool samples varies between about 10 and 25%. Importantly, it, a transient EPI has been uh, reported with low fecal elastase in about 4% of patients with Crohn's disease and about 10% of UC patients. There's also obviously a risk of it associated with uh, bowel uh, surgery. So there is a value 
to doing it in probably about 10 to 15 percent of cases. There are a number of guidelines that have been published in the last uh, seven years. Um, this was the first uh, and was saying that essentially if a fetal elastase was below the limit of detection of the assay, which was the SHIBO assay at 15, then there was a very high probability of exocrine insufficiency. Values between 15 and 200 with other supporting imaging uh, results also suggested EPI. Whereas a result greater than 200 was almost certainly uh, a very low probability of exocrine insufficiency. The delightful Australasian Pancreatic Club produced guidelines in 2015, uh, which stated uh, the difficulties in diagnosing uh, EPI um, and the laboratory testing was uh, valuable either using fecal fat, uh, chymotrypsin or elastase. Again, values less than 200 were in a good indication and they said if the value was less than 100, then the EPI was likely to be uh, severe. The European guidelines published in 2017 again took a cutoff of 200. Uh, and again, going at the assay, for example, the SHIBO, Shibo assay has an upper limit of uh, uh, assay uh, capabilities of 500 microgram per gram. So they said values less than 200 were definitely indicating EPI, values greater than 100 than 500 excluded it. Values in between is dependent upon other aspects. So to conclude, we have looked at and said secretin pancrozymin is the gold standard, but it's technically difficult and it's invasive. We know that amylase and lipase lack specificity. The vast majority of trypsin released is bound to alpha-2 and because of that binding cannot be measured by immunoassay. Trypsinogen is only useful where you have duct obstruction. We know fecal fat is unreliable due to patient compliance. Pancrolol and the NTB, uh, MBT PABA tests are no longer available and the breath tests that are sometimes mentioned uh, or discussed using uh, carbon-13 labelled trialine, I haven't looked at because they are not uh, FDA approved at the present moment. Whereas elastase measurement in faeces is non-invasive, it's simple and it's reliable in detecting EPI. A value less than 100 indicates severe disease, 100 to 200 mild to moderate, whereas values greater than 200 virtually exclude EPI and certainly values greater than about 500 definitely exclude EPI. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Sherwood, for your informative presentation. And as a reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you have submitted via email following this webinar. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Diasorin, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.